Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Chris. Very, very grateful to be here tonight, and this is a this has been a, an incredibly interesting a commitment for me because it really is the first time I've been exposed to uh, this draft of Bill's story. And uh, again, it predates uh, the edited version that ended up in uh, uh, the original manuscript, and, and that predated the. Uh, uh, the version that ended up in the first printing, first edition of the big book. So it's, I, I always believe it's interesting to go back to the earliest layer of any tradition. If, if you want to study religion, what, what you do the same thing. You go back to the earliest layer of tradition in that religion to really see what's going on. Because what happens is over the course of time, over the course of years, over the course of more and more literature being published, more and more layers of strata get put on top. And sometimes it's difficult to really get to the actual truth about what was going on during that period of time of miracles. And uh, the first first four years or so, five, six years of Alcoholics Anonymous was a time of miracles. Uh, people who uh, had suffered utter destitution were being, uh, were being raised up and reborn and uh, uh, became recovered alcoholics and were able to move on with their life. These were people that were pitiful, pathetic uh, uh, drunks. They, they were, you know, there was, they were absolutely considered hopeless by anybody in medicine, you know, anywhere. So it was a time of miracles, and we're getting a, we're getting a, a bird's eye view of that in this particular story. Um, now, before before we get going on that, I want to read, uh, what, I want to read two sentences from the Twelve and Twelve. Um, this this comes from Tradition Nine. Why it's in Tradition Nine, I don't know, but it's I think one of the most important two sentences in this book, the Twelve and Twelve. Unless each AA member follows to the best of his ability our suggested twelve steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. His drunkenness and dissolution are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from his personal disobedience to spiritual principles. If you relapse, it's because of your personal disobedience to spiritual principles. It is not usually because of the reason that you come up with, like, like she left me, or he left me, or I lost my job. No, it's because you have personally rejected spiritual principles. And that's that. You know, what What we're going to see in the second half of Bill's story is how Bill recovered, how he became a recovered alcoholic. Many things were at work in the early days. He was exposed to a number of Oxford Group people, n- number one of which was Sam Schumacher. But he was also exposed to Henrietta Cyberling and Ann Smith, who were also very, very advanced in the Oxford Group program. So he, he was basically being exposed to the spiritual principles that if we disobey, we're going to get drunk. He was being exposed to them. He was desperate enough to accept them in his life. And what happened was he recovered and decided to spend the rest of his life carrying the message of that discovery that spiritual principles will solve his alcohol problem. He decided that he would spend the rest of his life carrying that message. And we can, every single one of us in this room uh, should be incredibly grateful that he did that. Because there were a lot of people that recovered from alcoholism around the same time as Bill Wilson who did not decide to do that. They said, thank you for this. I'm getting on with my affairs. He decided that he was never going to work a day in his life again and just carry this message. And and you know what? He he did not live uh he did not live a life of, with a lot of material possessions or a lot of money. But he lived a life with uh, with one hell of a lot of spiritual uh spiritual gifts being being placed at his feet because he he did that. 
Now, again, the first half of Bill's story is what it was like and a little bit about what happened. The second half of his story is a little bit about what happened and what it's like today. It's about the recovery process. So let's look at this as, uh, let's look at the line of demarcation where we stopped last week. And now we're going to pick up on what happened and how he recovered. Uh, remember that he was sitting there drinking himself to death. All right, he's in this tiny little room in a terrible apartment somewhere in New York City, and he's drinking himself to death. He hasn't even tried to work in years. He knows he can't. All he can do is drink and keep that demon at bay one minute at a time, that, that alcoholic obsession, that compulsion to drink. So there he is, and all of a sudden his telephone rings. My music was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. This was one of Bill's drinking buttons. You know how we seek lower and lower companions as we sink lower and lower ourselves? You know, we party with the people that party like us. This was one of those guys. He had been committed for alcoholic insanity. Back in the day, they could commit you. If you got a couple of signatures on a piece of paper, you could be committed away to the booby hatch. You go, you know, you could, and, and this guy was actually committed for insanity. So rumor had it. I wondered how he had escaped. Escaped what? The hatch. Of course he would have dinner. Uh, then I would, then, then I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had completed an air, uh, uh, chartered an airplane to complete a jab. This was a beautiful story. This is back when he could actually get out of the house and drink. What had happened was the first airport uh, for Manchester was, I think it was Manchester, was going to be dedicated like on Sunday. They were going to have the opening dedication, you know, with the mayor and everything, and Bill decides the hell with, you know, the first airplane was going to land, okay? He says, the hell with that, let's charter a plane. They're drunk out of their minds, and let's go land on that airport. So sure enough, here comes this airplane landing on the airport the day before it was going to get dedicated by the mayor, and the marching band was there practicing, and they're looking, and all of a sudden he lands, and they fall out of the plane drunk. They can't even walk, you know? This is, the, this is the type of stuff he would do with his buddy, Evie, who is, uh, who is who we're talking about. Another glass stirred my fancy. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. The door opened. You know, I was drinking myself to death back in the mid-80s. I was, I was at my mother's house just because she wouldn't throw me out. And I couldn't, I couldn't leave the house and drink. I'd get arrested. So I would just buy bottles and drink, you know, the, a shivering denizen of, you know, my, the second story of my mother's house. And I'd just sit there and drink. And every once in a while, an old friend would call up and say, I'm coming over. And I'd be like, yeah, you know, how cool. Uh, they'd never come over again, I could tell you, because, because because I drank, I drank like it was my job, you know, and, and they're, they're just like, oh my God, this guy's drunk out of his mind, and uh, so they would never come back, but every once, every once in a while that would happen, so I know how he feels. He stood there, fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. You ever seen the lights go on in, in like a newcomer who's maybe gone through the steps or all of a sudden they get it? All of a sudden the lights come on upstairs. You know, that's an awakening. That's a spiritual experience. And he saw Abby like he'd never seen him before. This guy, this guy was, listen, I went back to my boss to make amends about four years after I quit drinking. And he looked at me and he goes, Chris, you're a young guy. <laughs> That's what he said. I looked. I looked ten years younger four years later because yeah. because I you know I was healthy and he could he didn't he couldn't even believe I was the same person. You know he knew I was but he couldn't believe it. What happened? I pushed the drink across the table. Not now, he said. Disappointed but curious, I wondered had what what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's this all about? I queried. 
he looked straight at me, simply but smilingly, he said, I got religion. This was the message of the early alcoholics back in the day when they were, when they were working in Oxford Group Program. If you look in the back there, uh, uh, one of the quotes, one of the quotes from, uh, from uh, William James is, the only cure for, uh, for inebriism is religiousism. And, and, you know, that's what they thought at the turn of the century, because the only hopeless alcoholics that were getting sober were the people that were engaging in these, these evangelical fellowships that just swoop you in, and they're all, they were almost cult-like. You know, every single night they had something for you to do. And, and those were the only alcoholics that were getting sober. I was aghast. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspect that a little cracked about religion. But he had that starry-eyed look. The old, boy, the old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer, but he did no ranting. In quite a, ma in quite a matter of way, fact of way, he related how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. What happened with that beat was, I'm not sure if I uh, talked about this last week or not, but what happened was, he got sent off to his summer house up in Vermont because his family wanted no, nothing more. He embarrassed the hell out of his family. And this one day, he, he drunk, he drove his car into a kitchen of these people, okay? You know, and, and, and when they came downstairs, like, oh, my God, there's a car in the kitchen. He, he rolled his window down and said, hey, you got any coffee? <laughs> you know, he was very unconcerned that his Pontiac was in their kitchen. You know, so the judge, the judge was upset. But the second thing that happened was he was painting the house. Pigeons were landing on the house. And he was, he had a resentment against those pigeons. So he took out his shotgun and started blowing the pigeons off the side of the house with his shotgun. And this was in a very confined residential neighborhood. You know, much to the neighbor's chagrin. So they called the police. And this, this was it. This was it. The judge was going to put him away. However, Roland Hazard was friends with the judge, had gotten sober in the auction group, and said, I'll tell you what, instead of locking him away, release him to my recognizance, I'll take him to New York, there's a cure for alcoholism it's in the auction group, I'll get him away from here. And the judge said, okay, I won't lock him up, but I never want to see this guy again, get him out of here. So, so now, now Ebby Thatcher is wandering around New York. He's got it. You know, he did the auction group. He's had the spiritual awakening and he's looking around for somebody to witness to. And he decides to call up Bill Wilson. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. All right. I'm going to stop here. This is, this is the Oxford groups, basically the Oxford groups big book. This is one of the pieces of literature that was very, very important to the early alcoholics prior to the writing of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It was called What is the Oxford Group? And it was handed out to people joining the Oxford Group so they could understand what the hell the Oxford Group was. And it was written by uh, the layman with a notebook. So he wanted to remain anonymous. Maybe this is where they got the idea to remain anonymous with the big book. All I'm going to do is read the contents section of this and ask yourself, does this ring a bell as far as our 12 steps are concerned? Okay? Sin. That's, that's the first chapter. Sharing for confession and witness. Surrender. Restitution. Guidance. And then there's the four absolutes which the early uh, AAs used with their guidance, that anything that they were going to do, they put them up against absolutely, uh, absolute honesty, pure, purity, unselfishness, and love to see if it was a guided thought, if it was what they, think, they, they would think God would want them to do. Now, sin, that's basically what, what, what they considered sin was missing the mark. Okay, we can see that basically as step one. What are the causes and conditions of, of our failure at life? Why are we missing the mark? Why are we alcoholic? Sharing for confession and witness, that can be, that can basically be the fifth step. Surrender, that can basically be the second and the third step. Restitution, that can be the eighth and the ninth step. Guidance can be the tenth and the eleventh step. So, this was the, this was an early picture of the architecture of a recovery process in the Oxford group. This is what he explained to Bill Wilson over that kitchen table. 
Um, that was the religious idea and a practical program of action. That was, that was months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. He had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. The sound of the preacher's voice, which one could hear on still Sundays, way over there on the hillside, that pro-offered temperance pledge I never signed, my grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings, his insistence that the, insistence that the spheres really had their music, his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen, his fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died, such, such recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. That wartime day in old Winchester Cathedral came back to me. He was being exposed in his alcoholic destitution. He was being exposed to religious and spiritual principles once again. But there was something about Ebby that got him to listen. Ebby wasn't drinking anymore. He was a changed person. He was probably going to survive. And Bill even thought that Ebby was a worse drinker than he was. In a power greater than myself, I had always believed. I had often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith in an illogical proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. If you study these early scientific people that were, that were coming uh, of age during this period of time, you'll see that most of them had a belief in God. Uh, science and religion have, have done this over the years. They've come together, they've gone apart. They've come together, they've gone apart. Right now, we're in a period of time where cosmologists and physicists, some of the top-level people, are, are coming back together with the, with, with the idea of God. Some of these people have come to the conclusion that existence, as it is now, from the Big Bang to us sitting here in this room, could not have happened by just mere physical coincidence. There had to be an idea involved, a divine intelligence of one form or another. And these are top-level physicists. So back in the day, some of his heroes, even, Car even Darwin believed in God. And, and, you know, people used Darwin's work to say there is no God, but Darwin was a believer. You know, so... So, a lot of his intellectual heroes believed in God, but they didn't believe in the religious type of God. They believed in, uh, in divine intelligence. They, they believed in uh, 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 cr uh, creationism, or, uh, you know, as, as some people believe today. Despite contraindications, I had little doubt that uh, a might, purpose, and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe, which knew neither time nor limitation. But that was as far as I had gone. With preachers and the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of a God personal to, to me, who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. How many people in here have had prejudice against organized religion or people in organized religion. Uh, let the record show half the hands of all 275 people here tonight have had such prejudices, okay? Now, Bill and Dr. Bob were two different kinds of people. Dr. Bob went back to church and you could find him in the same pew every single day till the day he died. He went right back in and jerned up. Okay, Bill had a hard time joining up. He took instruction from a Catholic priest. He took, took instruction from an Episcopal minister. He took instruction from a lot of people and came this close to joining the Catholic Church and bought. For the rest of his life, he had issues with organized religion. This did not stop him from recovering. It makes little difference whether you go back to church. It's probably preferable, but it makes little difference. This is a spiritual program. You know, I still have issues with, with certain 
functions of organized religion. I believe, I believe, I've gotten rid of most of my prejudice, if not all of it. And I believe that they, they do way more good than they do harm. And you have to understand that organized religion has human beings in it. You know? How, how are there not going to be human beings with faults? So there's going to be faulty, you know, religious systems sometimes. That's okay. Uh, uh, I've never been a joiner. I've got many, many friends. I sponsor priests. You know, I've got many, many friends who are, are uh, real faith-based people. And every single Sunday, without fail, they are in there. You know, and that's absolutely wonderful. But there are some people who, who, who still can't really make that leap into religion. However, that does not mean they're not really, really spiritual. And it's the spiritual principles that are going to keep us sober. Of Christ I conceded the certainty of a great man, not too much followed by those who claimed him. His moral teaching most excellent. I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. This is this is so me, you know. I mean, uh, you know, I read the Bible when I was drinking, and yet, you know, I mean, I, I was I was looking for answers because there was a hole in me. There was a spiritual vacuum in me, and I was trying to find something that'll give me some comfort. And I recognized the teaching of Jesus was completely alien to most religions. You know, if, 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 the, if the religions would actually do what Jesus told them to do, they wouldn't be able to have churches, you know. And I, you know, I had a lot of contradictions uh, and a lot of issues with, with all of this, so I relate to this guy. The wars which had been fought, the burnings and chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. What are most, most wars based on? My Jesus is different than your Jesus. That's what practically every war in the world is based on. I honestly doubted whether the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I had seen in Europe and since, the power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed boss universal, and he certainly had me. You know, one of the problems with, with religion, and one of the problems that we all have with God, is the problem of pain. The problem of suffering. I want to tell a little story. A bunch of Jewish people would have uh, Jewish services in one of the concentration camps in Germany. And this is while, while millions of them are being decimated and murdered. They, they're having their religious meetings. And one day they were just so upset with God that they decided they were going to put God on trial. And they put God on trial, and they found him guilty of, 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 of negligent homicide, not intervening in human affairs to stop this slaughter. And they found him guilty. What do you think they did right after the trial? They went into their prayer group. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, they went and they, they, they went right on with, uh, with their devotional practices. A lot of us have that problem with pain. And each of us have to come to terms with that somehow. Each of us have to come to terms with that somehow to move forward. You know, I've done it in my way. You may have to do that in your way, or you may have done that in your way. But I don't, I don't, believe, I don't believe God causes this pain. You know, I don't believe the earthquake. You know, God said, you know, I really can't stand Southern California. I think I'm going to quake their ass. <laughs> you know, I just, I just don't believe in that type of God. Or, 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 you know, I think I'm going to give that Schroeder guy cancer and, you know, let his neighbor, you know, live to 90. I just, I just don't believe that. I, I believe that there's something deeper at work. And we all need to come to terms with that. That's part of our spiritual growth. But my friend sat before me and he made the point-blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. He had tried to quit drinking many, many times. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. I, I think he actually escaped. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. In effect, he had been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. 
That's a promise in our book. Your life is going to be better than the best you've ever known if you engage in this spiritual war. Had this power originated in him? Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute. And this was none at all. That floored me. I began, it began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table, straight out of the here and now. I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. It went deeper than that. He was on a completely different footing. His roots grasped new soil. He was reborn. They talk in the book Alcoholics Anonymous about being reborn. And that's you think differently and you act differently. You know, you're, you, you know, you have a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. And here sat Ebby with this personality change across from Bill. And Bill is like, man, you know, he at the very least wanted to know what the heck happened to this guy. Thus I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. There's our part in the recovery process, and there's God's part. There's a beautiful line in the 12 and 12 that says, God will not render us white as snow with, without our cooperation. How then shall we cooperate? The architecture of the 12 steps answers that question. That's how we cooperate. That's how we place ourselves in the spiritual environment where God can, can, can take us from a pathetic wretch to a reborn individual. You know, we have to participate. We have to place ourselves in that spiritual climate. But if we do so, the sunlight of the Spirit will shine down on us, and we'll be taken care of. In the 12 and 12, in the first step, there's a great line. And uh, 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 the line basically is, Who among us wishes to admit complete defeat? Glass in hand, we've warped ourselves and our minds to such a state that only an act of divine providence can relieve us of our obsession. What is divine providence? That's the sunlight of the Spirit coming out of heaven on your ass is what it is. <laughs> that is what it is. Okay? The craziest thing I ever see is when I see a big book in the self-help section. This isn't a self-help program. This is a divine help program. And all we need to do is rightly relate ourselves and practice spiritual principles. That places us in the spiritual climate where God can do God's work. There are certain things that God can do. And there's certain things that he cannot or, or will not. So we need to find out what, what's going to work. And we, then we need to grab onto it. Like the drowning sees a life, life preserver. At long last I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted God. There was a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly within myself. So it had been ever since. It was simple as that. How blind I had been. He touched the divine. As alcoholics, we all want to experience oneness with the divine. That's why we drink. That's why we do heroin. That's why we do crack. We want to feel a touch of the divine. You know, he felt a little bit of it in the Winchester Cathedral, but he didn't do anything. He walked out of that church and he went about his life and he started shooting Germans and whatever else he did. And, you know, it just got blotted out by the worldly clamors. At the hospital, I was separated from king alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise then for I showed signs of delirium when I stopped drinking. Anybody in here ever experienced delirium tremens? Ho, ho, ho! Those are not fun, are they? Oh, whoa! That is, that is utter destitution. That is pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. That is the hideous four horsemen riding over your head. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair, panic, fear, terror. 
That's what the delirium tremens are. And, you, you know, listen, if you do go, if you do leave this room and ever drink again and experience those delirium tremens, you need medical attention. You need medical attention. Because you, here's the statistic. 15% of alcoholics get to a point where they suffer delirium tremens. It's the low part. The low bottom alcoholics experience delirium tremens. And 15% of the time, you have a delirium tremens, you die from it. So, so important warning sign. Okay, so right here in the hospital, now I want to explain this very, very clearly. These steps, which were the Oxford group processes, were taken on the hospital bed while he was detoxing. If somebody comes up to you and says, oh man, you know, you shouldn't do that four step until you have four years... Move as fast as you can away from an individual like that. That's not how they work this. They work this fast and furious, okay? That's how they did it back in the day. Yes, there's no time limit on all this, but if you'll see, these steps were taken while he was still on his detox bed, all except for 9 and 12. There, I humbly offered myself to God, as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. Sounds a little like the third step prayer, doesn't it? I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. Sounds a little like our first step, doesn't it? A first step admission of defeat. I ruthlessly faced my sins of omission and commission and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. That really sounds like step four through step seven, doesn't it? My schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. That sounds a bit like step five. We made a list of people I had hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. Sounds a little like eight. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. Little like step nine, doesn't it? I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except where my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. A little bit like step ten, but a whole lot like step eleven, isn't it? My friend promised that when those things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator, that I would have the elements of a way of life which answered all my problems. Every single person that walks through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous has two things, two things about them that I'm going to share that they don't think they have. They're not going to believe. Number one is that they're in way more trouble than they think they are. Every single time. They are minimizing like a sumbitch. Okay? The second thing is, is they're not giving the processes of Alcoholics Anonymous enough credit. Because the processes of Alcoholics Anonymous, they may think, well, maybe I'll be able to quit drinking. How about maybe you'll have, not only that, but you'll have a better life than anything you could have imagined prior to walking through the doors of AA. You know, nobody walking through the doors of AA is thinking that. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirement. These are essential requirements for recovery. If you don't have these in your life and you drink again, do not blame Alcoholics Anonymous. Do not wander around the bar saying, I went to A&A &A and it didn't work for me. Okay? We don't need the black eye. Okay? We don't need the black eye. Uh... If you don't do these things, you don't practice the recovery process. Do not be fooled by people that try to lock you into fellowship-based sobriety. That is short-changing you. There's more available. There's more available. There's three types of drinkers usually in the bar. 30% of them are sitting there drinking and they're just, they're crying in their beer. They're, they're like, oh. Okay, 30% of the people are wandering around trying to pick people up. They get real amorous, you know, and they're like hitting and hustling. 
but 30% but 30 of those people want more out of alcohol. So they're running around trying to get cocaine, or they're running into the city, or, you know, they're just, I, you know, I want to go, I want to go to Manhattan, you know, and, you know, and they're running around, let's do this, let's do that, because they want more out of alcohol. That's how we're supposed to approach this program of recovery. I want more than sobriety. I want recovery. You know, be one of those people. Because you can go to you can go to the ocean with a thimble or you can go to the ocean with a bathtub. It's gonna get filled. You might as well go there with a bathtub. You know what I'm saying? Uh, simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It really meant the obliteration of self. I had to quit playing God. This is all third step stuff. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. This is the guidance piece of the 11th step. If you want to learn about how they did the 11th step, there's some great material in the back. One of the great pamphlets, I don't know if we have one here, is How to Listen to God. John, do we have that here? The, uh, how to Listen to God. I don't remember who, who wrote it way back in the auction group day. We have the book How to Listen to God is Okay. All right. Um, these were he didn't actually write it. He 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 you know he yeah he uh, he resurrected it out of the archives of uh, the Oxford. But it's wonderful. It shows how these AAs, these early alcoholics, sat and listened to God. How they went into meditation to like a guided prayer and then a a meditation seeking that those intuitive thoughts. Uh, and actions that they should be taking, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And God spoke to them through their intuitive capacity. And they called that, they called that the, the fourth dimension, or the realm of the spirit, where you could actually pick up and listen to God. And sometimes the thoughts were from God. And so they put them up against the four absolutes. If the thoughts were honest, pure, un un unselfish, and loving, they didn't consider them coming from God. So, you know, these were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, followed by such a peace and serenity I had never known. Remember, he had a white light experience. He had a spiritual awakening like that. It talks about in the spiritual appendix, most of us have spiritual awakenings of the educational variety. Why did Bill have a quick one? He did the steps while he was detoxing. That's why he had a quick one. Why do we have a slow one? Because we don't do a fourth step till we got six months. That's why. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the, uh, the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact upon me was sudden and profound. For a moment I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I was still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. He finally shook his head saying, something has happened to you I don't understand, but you had better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. He was dying. The good doctor now sees many men uh, ha that have had such experiences. He knows that they are real. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given to me. Right then and there is why we're here. Right then and there is why we're here. Because he had this guided thought after a spiritual awakening. He's still detoxing. And he decides to dedicate the rest of his life to alcoholics. And he did. And we're here because of it. But no major changes in your first year. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of lip-flapping things that go on in Alcoholics Anonymous today, okay? And, and they're coming from treatment centers and they're coming from lazy sponsors. You know, uh, if it ain't in the big book, it ain't, okay? That's a, that's a good rule of thought. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of my demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Uh, this is step 12. Particularly was it imperative to work with others, as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said. And this is where Bill got the idea that he needed to carry the message to other alcoholics. And he started doing it. And for six months, he was grabbing people off the bar stool and, and talking to them about Jesus. And they were saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, leave me alone. I'm drinking. 
It was only until he went out to Akron and he got a little bit of perspective on how to do this and how to explain the hopelessness of your situation and then offer you the spiritual solution that he became, started to become successful with alcoholics. And how appallingly true for the alcoholic. Faith without works is dead. The book of James is in the Bible where faith without works is dead. They almost called Alcoholics Anonymous the James Club. That was one of the names that they were they were passing around because they used the book of James so much. Dr. Bob read out of the book of James. Before the big book was around, they used the Bible in the AA meetings for their for their for their conference approved literature. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. Important. I'm going to read this again with emphasis. Uh, if an alcoholic fails to perfect and enlarge their spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, they will not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead you'll find a bottle in your hand. Now, if you're a relapser and you've been coming to AA and you've been sitting in the rooms and eating the cookies and drinking the coffee and you're still drinking, my question to you is, what kind of work and self-sacrifice for others are you engaged in? Or are you still on the foundation of selfishness and self centeredness What's in AA for me? Okay? You're supposed to drink if you're not helping other people. You're not likely to. You're supposed to. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. If he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. My wife and I abandon ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problems. It was fortunate for my old business associates to remain skeptical for a year and a half during which I found little work. I was not too well at the time and was played by waves of self-pity and resentment. He lived in like 40 different places in the first five years of AA, didn't, didn't he, John? I mean, he, you know, I mean, he, he, he was not going to go back to work. He, he probably couldn't, but he wasn't. You know, and Lois held like a department store clerk job. She was making probably two fifty a, a week, $2.50 a week, you know. And he was running around with his new AA guys all over the place uh, carrying the message. This was sometimes, this sometimes nearly drove me back to drink. I soon found that when all other ma measures failed, work with an, another alcoholic would save the debt. So when you're at a point where you're at a low point in your recovery, you're at a low point, you're hitting a sober bottom, what are you supposed to do? Double up your meetings? No. No. We don't need you bringing your problems into twice as many meetings. <laughs> You know what I mean? What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go to the rehabs, the detoxes, the jails, the institutions, and carry the message. If you ain't doing that, you're supposed to drink. Many times I have gone to my old hospital feeling terrible. On talking to a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for a living that works in tough spots. We commenced to make many fast friends, and a fellowship has grown up among us of which is a wonderful thing to be a part. It certainly was, because he, he was the hot shit in it. You know what I mean? He was Bill. Let's go ask Bill. You know? His dream of being number one guy was fulfilled. The joy of living we really have, even under pressure and difficulty. I'm telling you, I've got some real pressure on my life today. I have chose, chosen a, a direction in my life that is really rocky and really rough. But I know I need to be going down that way. Three years ago, I was making Manhattan money. I walked away from Manhattan money to do something good with my life. And I am not able to monetize it the way I would like to. And I'm really struggling financially. I mean, really struggling financially, more so than I ever was when I was drinking. When I was drinking, I always had a job that paid a paycheck, and I was always able to pay my bills. I am really struggling right now, but I know, I know I'm doing the right thing. And you know what? Even under pressure, pressure and difficulty, the joy of living is all over me. I am enjoying every minute on God's wonderful, beautiful, holy earth. I really am. And I'm enjoying every single moment with every single person I'm interacting with. 
And if I've got some struggles, you know what, in, in the perspective of things, they really are kind of small. I've seen 100 families sit on their feet in the path that really goes somewhere. We have seen the most impossible domestic situations righted. Feuds and bitterness of all sorts have been wiped out. I've seen, I've seen men come out of asylums and resume a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. He used to, he, he and his boys, because they did a lot of work out of Montclair, he and his boys used to go to Greystone, they used to go to, what's the hospital's name in Montclair? Mountainside. Mountainside. And they used to go in there, and, and the people that were like rocking, you know, they're, they're still in alcoholic, you know, wet brain almost. They would drag them out to meetings, and, every, every, and there'd be miracles. And some of these people would regain their standing in the world. They had been locked away in Greystone. Okay, anybody in here ever take a meeting into Greystone? I have. I have. You know what I'm talking about, okay? They were going in there, and they were bringing them out to meetings, and some of them were recovering. This is, a, this is, a, this is something that you just, you got to experience this. You know, you have to experience it, and this is what he was doing. Business and professional people have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of human misadventure and misery which has not been overcome among us. How is that for a promise? You know, uh, I'm sure all of you go to meetings where the 12 promises are up on the wall, right? They, they shortchange you by just giving you 12. <laughs> well, here's one right here. Any sort of human misadventure and misery can be overcome. Any sort. You know, this is amazing. In a western city and its environs, there are 60 of us in our families. This is Akron slowly going out to Cleveland. We often meet informally at our homes so that newcomers may find what they seek. Okay, T. Henry and Clarice Williams had a big-ass old house. And they just used to let the AAs just pile on in. And, you know, they were Christian people, and they saw that God's work was being done. Why do you think we're in this basement right now? Why do you think the minister of this church said, uh, $10 a week? Uh, it costs us 50 just for the heat. Uh, okay. Why do you think, why do you think we're in this basement? It's because they know God's work is, is being done down here. They know. And they know some of us will trickle upstairs and become decent church members and, you know, pay, you know, tithe a couple of grand a year. You know, they, they know it. They, you know what I'm saying? They know. We're, we're, that's where we are. We're in the church basements. Gatherings of 20 to 60 are common. We are growing in numbers and power. Little did he know. Uh, conservative estimates uh, are there's about 4 million, maybe 5 million sober AA members in the world today. There are gazillion groups. There, there are emerging AA areas. You want, to get in, you want to get involved in something really, really exciting, find a country. And with the advent of Facebook and email and, you know, cheap airline travel, you can get involved with these countries. I'm, I'm involved. I sponsor people in eight different countries today. Okay? And there are, there are emerging AA areas that are waking up. They're about where we are in the 40s and 50s today. And they can use a little bit of help. They can use a little bit of understanding. They're taking our literature, misunderstanding the shit out of it, and there's all kinds of problems that are going on in these different countries. And they, they need a little bit of mentorship. They need a little bit of communication with people who, who have got a lot of experience over here. It's really, really interesting out there. It really is. There are basically secular countries secular ass countries most of them are atheists and what's happening is Alcoholics Anonymous is sprouting and people are finding spirituality and they're finding a way to God it's, it's, it's almost an, a missionary endeavor you know and you weasel your way in there through AA it, it's just some really exciting stuff listen your life depends upon being of service of, of self sacrifice to others your life depends on it what I'm telling you is there's a lot of really interesting opportunities out there. There's a lot of really fun things that you can get involved with. Given a newcomer, your phone number at the door is not intensive work with other alcoholics. 
intense, you know, because you ain't, you know, they ain't gonna call you. You know, so, so you just, you look pretty good doing it, though. Yeah, here's my number. Intensive work with other alcoholics is what they're telling us we need to do. Work and self-sacrifice for others. If you fail to adhere to those spiritual principles, you will not find utter desolation from, from, uh, from people in authority. You're going to find it from not adhering to the spiritual principles. And the number one main spiritual principle is, after you've had a spiritual awakening, as a free gift, from someone else and from God, you need to you need to carry that to somebody else. And there's a lot of opportunities out there. Find what you're comfortable with. Find what you're good at. Each of us has a set of tools. Some of us aren't any good at going into prisons and carrying the message. Some of us are. Some of us aren't any good on the service committees, the AA service committees. Some of us are. Some of us aren't any good at speaking at conventions or running around running around like an idiot big shot. Some of us are. You know, find what you can do and then do it. Because whatever you put into this thing, you're going to get back out tenfold. I can guarantee you that. An alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see what we beheld. Very non-judgmental. Do not ever get angry at somebody who's drinking. Do not ever get angry at somebody that walks away from this program. Do not. They either cannot or will not. It's, they're, not in, they're not a moron or an idiot. They either cannot or will not. It's a beautiful way to put it. We can't help everybody. What we're supposed to do, read the chapter working with others. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to just just cultivate prospects. You know, talk to as many people as you can. Every once in a while, you're going to get a star. In the mid-90s, I did a lot of work with other people. I was on a, I was on a mission, and I attracted these relapsers, these people who had been in and out of AA for 20 years. And what happened was they came over to my house, they went through the steps, they recovered from alcoholism, and they started to work with other people. Every single one of them is still sober today. They're card-carrying, members in good standing in AA, working with other people, and their quality of life is out the roof. I was able to create a fellowship I created through intensive work with other alcoholics. And these are guys who would take a bullet for me. They'd give me their last dollar if I needed it. And they tell me that on a constant basis. Do you want that? We all want that. We all want a sense of community, a tight sense of community. It's available. It's available in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some of us would be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity. But just underneath, one finds a deadly earnestness. I hope that you find that in, in, in the way I speak. I, you know, I can be humorous at times, but I am deadly ass earnest. You know, this, this illness kills and it kills in a horrible way. You would be better off with terminal cancer than with alcoholism. Cancer at least allows you the dignity of setting your affairs in order before you check out. When you check out as an alcoholic or drug addict, you are at the absolute bottom of your existence. People, the people that still have anything to do with you pity you or resent you, one or the other. Do you want to check out that way in disgrace? I don't. Uh, God has to work 24 hours a day in and through us, or we perish. Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia, nor even for heaven. We have it with us on this good old earth, right here and now. Each day, that simple talk in my kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. Uh, John, thank you again for asking me to come up here. This is a great group. I love you guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.